There's only one way you can stop inflation, and that's by having the government create less money and spend less money. And the reason we have inflation is because the public at large wants inflation. You people want inflation. You don't say so. No one of you will say, I want inflation. But I ask you, do you want the prices at which you sell things to go down? Not the prices at which you sell them. You want the prices at which you buy them to go down. What everybody wants is for the prices of the things he buys to go down and the prices of the things he sells to go up. Especially businesses. But that's a neat trick if you can manage it. But isn't it, isn't it good old Adam Smith? Isn't that what he... Of course, it's good old Adam Smith provided. You have a control in terms of the total amount of money available, but it's not good old Adam Smith for those printing presses to be pouring out paper money, okay. Okay. Which, uh, which you and I and the government in particular can use. We don't, we don't create inflation by our personal behavior. We create inflation by getting our legislators, the people in Washington, to vote for more and more spending and by objecting to extra taxes and therefore by having it financed by printing money. They don't produce inflation for one simple reason. They do not own a printing press on which you can turn out green pieces of paper. The only such printing press is in Washington. I say printing press, of course, in the modern age, we do it in a more sophisticated way. We use bookkeepers and accountants and computers. But it comes down to the same thing. Inflation is made in Washington because only Washington can create money. And any other attribution of, to other groups of inflation is wrong. Consumers don't produce it. Producers don't produce it. The trade unions don't produce it. Foreign sheiks don't produce it. Oil imports don't produce it. What produces it is too much government spending and too much government creation of money and nothing else. If the government prints money and exchanges it for goods and services, should there be no inflation? And in the case of a stimulus check, could an increase in goods and services produced to meet that extra demand also curb inflation? They recognize this stuff as the raw material from which their cigarettes are made. But in the early days of the colonies, long before the United States was established, this was money. It was a common money of Virginia, Maryland, and the Carolinas. It was used for all sorts of things. The legislature voted that it could be used legally to pay taxes. It was used to buy food, clothing, and housing. Now, you know how money is. There's a tendency for it to grow, for more and more of it to be produced. And that's what happened with this tobacco. As more tobacco was produced, there was more money. And as always, when there's more money, prices went up, inflation. Indeed, at the very end of the process, prices were 40 times as high in terms of tobacco as they had been at the beginning of the process. And as always, when inflation occurs, people complained. Gresham's Law, one of the oldest laws in economics, was well illustrated. That law says that cheap money drives out dear money, and so it was with tobacco. Anybody who had a debt to pay, of course, tried to pay it in the worst quality of tobacco he had. He saved the good tobacco to sell overseas for hard money. The result was that bad money drove out good money. Finally, almost a century after they had started using tobacco as money, they established warehouses in which tobacco was deposited in barrels certified by an inspector according to his views as to its quality and quantity. And they issued warehouse certificates, which people s gave from one to another to pay for the bills that they accumulated. Doesn't it seem as if the real reason for the inflation would be from the paying of debts and poor quality tobacco? If you kept getting paid in dollar bills that were only worth 80 cents, wouldn't you raise your prices to account for that? The reason we have inflation in the United States, or for that matter, anywhere in the world, is because these pieces of paper and the accompanying book entries, or their counterparts in other nations, are growing more rapidly than the quantity of goods and services produced. But if your currency itself is a goods item, wouldn't that mean the money supply hasn't changed at all? And let's not forget that the production of cotton was responsible for considerable amounts of wealth being generated. 
Let me imagine with you that helicopters fly over the American cities and drop the money, and we all run out with baskets and collect the bills floating down. Okay, now there's a lot more money in the economy. And you know who knows this? Business. They know that the public has more money to spend because they know what the Federal Reserve is doing, whether it's increasing the money supply or not. And at this point, the employer makes a decision. The manufacturer, the, the, the company that sells any service, they know people have more money to spend. So here's what they decide. Either the way you deal with that is to raise your price. Why? Because people have more money to spend, and so you can reasonably expect to get the higher price. Or, here comes the key issue, folks, or you can decide that the way you want to respond to the extra money in the economy is by ordering more goods to sell for that extra money. The second one gives people jobs making the extra goods, and we tend to like that. But the first one, jacking up the price, that's not getting anybody a new job. That's just getting the seller more because there's more money in the economy. It's a decision of employers that is the cause of every inflation. Employers set the price. Why would you go to all the effort of hiring more people, supply chain issues, machinery costs, etc., when it's easier and more profitable to simply raise prices.